one of the things that directors, the directors who are most intimidated by previs are the ones that don't know the technology or don't know how to work with it. And what they're afraid of is somebody will make this sort of previs version of their, um, of their scene and it'll get out and you know studio execs will see it and producers will see it and they'll go well why don't you just do it this way and that's not the way they want to do it and they don't quite have the rapport with the previous people to do it. One of the things that I like as a designer of having a very good command of the computer technology that can help me design really rapidly in 3D is I can work with a director instead of just sketching I can have I can have a screen there and, and as soon as he goes oh Jim, I don't think that they should be walking in that way. I think it needs to be something else. I can adjust right there. Rather than, you know, having spent ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars on a previs with these guys going, okay, we'll fix this and come back and talk to you in a week. You know, you address that issue right there. When you go through, here's what the here's what the set is designed for. It, Actor A enters here, actor B enters here, they have the fight here, they have the intimate dialogue here, they make love over here. And this is the imagery that's behind them, this is the kind of potential you have for moving the camera, these are the things that could potentially be smashed up, this is the wall that could, could potentially collapse, whatever, and you talk about those processes with an actual set right there in front of you, looking at, looking at it. And you make changes and then eventually by the time it gets to the real previs where they have the stiff little guys walking through and they do that stuff. The director's already had his input. He's already figured it out. And and this is more to tell everybody else what, you know, what is a potential way of seeing it. Now the other thing that you can work out with a director too is he says, I don't want to be tied down here. And that's great because then you know, okay, well I've got to build this much set to give him a little bit of flexibility. We've got to expand the sandbox a little bit because this is what he needs to work with his actors to get the scene he wants. That's fine. As long as you know about it in advance and you don't paint him into a corner, then it all works for the movie. The uh, the Cray supercomputer that rendered the last Starfighter cost over twenty million dollars, and now somebody with a Power Mac can do the same job better. Um, on the other hand, the techniques have not changed at all. It's still a question of making sure that you that you work out the imagery of a film in advance and uh, and then go about deciding what the best technologies are to execute those images. And um, that hasn't changed since the Mele, uh, George Mele was making movies in France at the turn of the last century. I think um, I think when people ask me about 300, for instance, they say, well, that's the new way of making movies. But I, but I have to point out How Green Was My Valley, or Black Narcissus, or uh, Black Beauty. These were films that took place in a Welsh mining town, or in the fields of England, or, um, uh, or in Tibet, the mountains of Tibet. And they were all filmed on backlot sound stages. And they were carefully planned, and through the use of uh, blue screen mats, uh, painted backdrops. Um, the artists who designed these sets, these designers and artists who executed these sets, carefully worked out exactly what the foreground was, what the midground was, and what the background was. And they decided then when to use the different te techniques that were available to them, whether they were painted backdrops or forced perspective sets or glass shots. However, but they but they carefully plotted the series of images that were needed to tell the story and they used the techniques at hand. That is an essential part of this job. You still have to do that and even if you have a wonderful tool like the computer. The thing that I find so exciting now is the computer can create in the pre-production stages a whole world, a whole three-dimensional world that you can explore with a director and with a writer that then you can figure out exactly and really refine uh, what this world is that you're going to create for the story. And, and that's, uh, to me, the exciting part of immersive design. What used to come start with just a sketch, now starts with a 3D model. And you can take a, a sketch and you can only draw so fast and you can only keep the accuracy of the 3D in your head so much. Uh, but now you have this computer, this wonderful door that opens up right into the world that you're creating for the story and it's just amazing. I was a second unit director on The Boy Who Could Fly.
and one of the big problems we had was we had to fly stunt doubles around a carnival and we wanted to chase the stunt doubles and the photo doubles with a flying camera as they flew around ferris wheels and various things so we used a computer to plot out how the ferris wheel would go around and how the various spinning things would go and where we would put the crane and how we would swing the stunt doubles and how we would put the four towers of the sky cam so that it could go unencumbered without running in the cables running into the ferris wheel and the and the and the rotating I guess it was a bullet ride or something like that and then and also how it would time of day we had to shoot it so that we didn't catch the shadows of the towers of the cranes or the whatever piece of equipment we had and it was very helpful we plotted the whole thing out and we were despite you know some equipment malfunctioning in the sky cam and everything else we got all the shots we needed in three days it was amazing well I think what's really interesting is uh, we can now go back to material that creates worlds that don't exist anymore uh, and be a little bit more fastidious academically about it. Whereas, um, and I don't want to use Ben-Hur as an example, but where before sometimes we would make, do a, do a design and we were confined by what we, what we could find for locations, for instance. Uh, now we can create a digital city, uh, in Paris of the 1880s, San Francisco of 1906, uh, and we can we can explore that city visually and see what parts of it we want to bring to life in a foreground constructed set, and how we maintain the integrity of the city the way it actually was through digital models that are then used as background backgrounds. And uh, I think that's pretty exciting. And the, and the fact of the matter, if it's an intimate story, you don't have to build a whole lot. That's a, that's a decision between the director, the designer, and, um, and in a way, the actors. It's how much can you build to give the actors what they need in their dramatic sandbox to bring the story to life. What do they need to interact with? And uh, uh, I tend to be uh, really excited by that. If a set is a sandbox that the shooting company goes to play in, I want that sandbox to have inherent in it all of the images that are necessary for forwarding the story, forwarding the narrative, and also resonating with the story on both a psychological, historical, chronological level. And in order to do that, it becomes almost like a machine. It becomes like a storytelling machine. It becomes something that you have to explore the images that you want, how you're going to capture those images in geographical space, how you're going to make sure that architectural conventions are not violated or stylistic conventions are not violated to the point that the audience is pulled out of the story, and how all of those are inherent in this set, in this space, so that the director and the actors and the director of photography can go into this space, they can play a little bit, but there are the there are the images, there are the arresting images that you want that help the audience go, wow, so that's what the story is all about. And, and they're compelled and engaged in, in the story and in the world of the story.